Next, we have the live industry. So that part of the business that um, puts on shows and tours and festivals. The live industry is very separate from the music rights industry. And uh, although there are, in music rights, there are companies which are both labels and publishers, and actually all the majors now are also in the merchandise business. Okay, all the major record companies have set up, or in most cases bought, merchandise companies. However, in the main, you're either a music rights company or you're a live company. And Universal have dabbled in live, and Live Nation have dabbled in recordings, but in the main, they're very separate industries. Um, and generally speaking, although the music rights industry and the live industry all work with the same artists, so they all have the same artist relationships, they sort of treat each other with a bit of contempt. Okay, so the, the, music, the music rights industry are like, we do all the work, we do all the investment, and then those promoters, they go and, and take all the money by putting on shows with artists that we help build. And the live industry is prone to say, Oh, the music rights industry, they're all in a mess, aren't they? Music rights industry died. Look at us doing really well. So the, the two industries sort of, they work with the same artists, but they are very separate. And the culture is quite different too. They occasionally meet in court um, because the live industry is a customer of the music rights industry. Because whenever you put on a show, you're exploiting the publishing rights. Because obviously, there's a live performance of a song. So you need a license from the publishers, usually through their collecting societies. If you have recorded music playing in a venue, then you need two licenses, one to cover the publishing rights and one to cover the recording rights. In the UK, PRS, which represents the publishing rights, is reviewing what it charges the promoters. The promoters will almost certainly take that to court because PRS are almost certainly going to put the rates up and the promoters will say, we're not paying you any more money and they'll take it to court. So occasionally, the music rights industry and the live industry do meet in the courtroom. So in order for the record industry to make money from the live performance, this is where this 360 deal comes from? Correct, and we'll talk more about that this afternoon. So let's quickly talk through the different companies in the live space. So the promoter, let's start with the promoter. The promoter puts on the show. Okay, so they, they, they put the money on the table, they book the venue, usually they will get, pay the artist an upfront fee, they do all the tech, they get all the sound guys and, and the lighting guys in, they, they, they organise the tickets, they put the tickets on, on a ticketing platform, and they take all of the risk and then will usually take a, a, a cut of the revenue that comes in and that's how they make their money back. So that's what the promoter does. The promoter is, in most other entertainment industries, we would call this person the producer. So in theatre, or dance, or comedy, this is the producer. Uh, in music, we call them promoters because, well, the producer's the, the person in the studio pressing the buttons on the sound desk. So it would be confusing to call these people producers. So we call them promoters. Uh, it sort of suggests that they're just in the publicity part, but they're not. They actually put on the show. Between the artist and the promoter, we then have the agent, or what is sometimes more specifically called the booking agent. And the thing to say about the agent is that the agent is different to the manager. Okay, So most artists will have both a manager and an agent. And the agent is only involved in the live side of the artist's career. And the reason why you have a separate person negotiating live deals, negotiating deals with the promoter, finding opportunities with promoters, working out what the terms are, making sure that you get, as an artist, as much money out of the booking as possible. The reason why we have someone just doing that job is because, as an artist, you are constantly taking live bookings. You're always looking for new opportunities. You're always looking for new business partners. You're always negotiating new deals. With music rights, if you do a label deal, usually you're then locked into that label deal for, for the next five, six, seven, eight years. It will normally be a number of records that you are obliged to deliver, assuming the label chooses to uh, exercise its option to have those records. So you do a label deal, it's a lot of work, you pay a lot of money to lawyers, you write a very thick contract, and then you're in business with that label for the foreseeable future. Even if you fall out, usually there's nothing you can do about that, you're locked in. Same with publishing. Usually publishing deals, you'll be with a publisher for the next 10 years. Whereas with live, you're constantly doing new deals. In the main, you only work with a promoter for as long as the next tour. And at the end of that tour, you're free to go and do a deal with whichever promoter you want. A lot of artists work with different promoters around the world. You know, one promoter in Europe, one promoter in North America, another promoter in the Caribbean, another promoter in Australia, because promoters will have local expertise. Even if you do a global deal with Live Nation, and you only tour with Live Nation for the next five years. So Madonna locked herself into a 10-year deal with Live Nation worldwide. So Madonna now only tours 
with Live Nation. However, most artists still want to play festivals. Okay? And so the Live Nation doesn't own all the festivals. So even if you have an exclusivity deal for touring with one promoter, you're still doing deals with festival promoters all over the world. So you're constantly looking for new opportunities, you're constantly doing new deals, and that's why we have an agent to find those opportunities and to negotiate those deals. And the agents are known for being the real hard-nosed people of the music industry. They drive a hard bargain. Uh, most agents will have established artists and new artists on their book, and if you're a festival, usually the condition is, I'll give you my famous artists for your main stage, but the condition is you book my three new artists for your new band stage. Agents are generally on a 10% commission, so therefore they will drive up to get as high a rate as possible, because 10% of nothing is nothing. Um, as, as if, 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 like me, you sometimes organise showcase events where artists come and play predominantly for an industry audience, and usually with showcase events there's not a lot of money for the artist, because we're, we're not making any money out of it, um, and so you'll go to artists and say, well, will you play my showcase event, and the artists will be like, I'd love to do that, of course. Speak to my agent. And, and your heart sinks because, because agents will always try and drive it up. Because 10% of nothing is nothing. Um, and it will always be harder work the minute an agent gets involved. But that's their job. Um, some people have a global agent, although in the main, if you're a truly global artist, you will have a number of agents around the world working for you. So you might have a primary agent, say in New York or London, but you'll have other agents who, who understand a different market. Because agents aren't just deal makers, they bring knowledge of the live sector to you. So for example, if you're doing two shows, let's say you're doing, I don't know, you're doing a, a show in New York and then you're doing another show in um, Atlanta, Okay, so New York show Monday, Atlanta show Wednesday, a good agent will say, well, between New York and Atlanta, there's this place where you could do a show on Tuesday. And it's a smaller show, but it means that we'll make a little bit more money. So knowledge about routing is something that agents bring to the table, let alone visas, which is not something we're going to talk about. But once you start touring globally, there's a whole industry in negotiating the visas, particularly if you're playing the US. I don't know if the US are nicer to you guys than they are to us in the UK. It's a nightmare getting into the US as a UK person. Um, OK, so we have the promoter and the agent, and then the other obvious ones. Obviously, there are the venues uh, and the venue owners. A lot of venues will have in-house promoters that put on shows, but they will also work with external promoters and bring other shows in. And then you have the ticketing companies and a little bit of PR and marketing. Um, the two big players in live music worldwide or Live Nation and AEG. Um, Live Nation um, are the biggest promoters in the world, the second biggest venue owners in the world, and as Ticketmaster, the biggest ticketing company in the world. So Live Nation pretty much have the live sector. It, it's hard to take Live Nation on. AEG are also uh, promoters and venue owners. Um, and of course, there are lots and lots of local and independent and regional live companies too. Ticketing companies, I'll just say one thing about ticketing companies. The obvious thing a ticketing company brings to the table is a platform through which to sell tickets. However, ticketing companies bring other things to the table too. And the two important things are marketing. So good ticketing companies have a database of people that they can market shows to. So they're not just putting the, the ticket sales on their website and then letting you do the marketing. They can help you sell the tickets. Having said that, be wary because every ticketing company will tell you how good their marketing database is and it's not always true. Uh, the other thing the big ticketing companies bring to the table is cash flow. And it's one of the reasons why companies like Ticketmaster retain incredible market dominance. Because if you're putting on an arena tour, it's expensive. And a lot of your costs are up front. So as a promoter, you need a million, million dollars in your bank account tomorrow. And so you go to a big ticketing company and say, give me the money now for tickets you're going to sell. So not for tickets you've already sold, but for tickets that you're going to sell. Advance me the money. And only the big ticketing companies can afford to do that. And that's why a company like Ticketmaster remains a dominant player in the market, despite a multitude of startups entering that market with, in my opinion, vastly superior products. But what they don't have is cash flow. And for a lot of promoters, at a, once you reach a certain level, the single most important thing is, well, who's going to give me money now so that I can afford to rent the venue and pay the advance to the artist and do all of the upfront costs? costs um, on tickets that may or may not get sold down the line. So it's one of the important things that ticketing companies do. The fan relationship sector is, is the newest part of the music industry. Um, this idea of we now have this director-fan relationship, how can we give those fans what they want and generate revenue from them? And so we're starting to see director-fan companies emerging. Now, 
different direct fan companies do different things. Some are technology companies, and they provide you with the platform. So a company like Pledge Music or Bandcamp, or in the UK we have Music Glue, and they're predominantly technology companies that help you reach fans, crunch data, sell product. There are also direct fan companies which are marketing companies, which help you with the fan base building and working out how to you know, capture and understand fans. And there are direct fan companies which are strategic or fulfillment companies that actually help you work out a director fan strategy and also do the fulfillment, run the director fan store and, and all of that side of it too. And then the final company to mention is the brand partnership agency. We all know brands like music. Okay, and lots of brands around the world put a certain portion of their sponsorship and marketing money every year into music. Um, now, quite where that fits into my diagram depends on what the brand wants. If the brand wants to give away recordings, or they want to use a song and a recording in an advert, then actually that's part of the music rights industry. They would go to the labels and the publishers and they would negotiate a licensing deal. If what the brand wants is a massive logo above the door of the venue or above a stage at a festival, then actually that's part of the live industry. And it's an important part of the live industry. But if what they want is artist endorsement, if what they want is access to the artist's online fan base, then that's fan relationship. The challenge for brands is they usually want all three of those things, and no one person can usually sell all of those things. So one of the challenges of brand partnerships is who is going to navigate the politics and the infrastructure of the music industry to get the brand, the recording and the songs and the merch and the tickets and the exposure at the live shows and the artist endorsement, which is actually what they want. But I put brand partnerships in with a fan relationship because ultimately what most of brands want is they want your fans to like them. Okay? Uh, we're a brand, we want people to love us, you're an artist, you've got people who love you, how can we piggyback on your platform to get love from your fan base? Um, and that is part of the fan relationship business. And there are a number of agencies now who specialise in brand partnerships. It's worth mentioning that both the labels and the promoters are in the director fan business and they're in the sponsorship business, as are the agents. So this, this evolving fan relationship part of the music business, you've got startups in this space, but you've also got labels trying to get established in this space and you've got agents and promoters trying to get established in this space. So there are other people in the existing music industry who see this opportunity and they're trying to get themselves in there. These are all the different sorts of companies who artists look to do business deals with. Although there is the one person who I've already said is increasingly the most important in this whole affair, which is the manager. And the manager sits between the artist and everybody else. So most artists start off on their own, okay? DIY, do it yourself. Although as somebody said in the intro, DIY doesn't actually mean do it yourself. It means find like other artistic people to collaborate with who have other skills, okay? People who are excited about photography or art or social media or journalism. So build a little team of collaborators that you can grow your business with. But most artists, the first business partner they're really looking for is the manager because the manager sits between them and everybody else. And most artists these days will have management and agent in place long before label. Um, and so a lot of new artists, they think, I need a label deal, need a label deal. But actually, I mean, there are still some artists who that is the first deal they do. But if you don't have a manager in place before you do a label deal, who negotiates a label deal? Um, some lawyers would say you should have a lawyer first, because if you don't have a lawyer in place, who's going to negotiate the management deal? Um, but most artists these days, it's the manager who comes first. And, and the manager's role is interesting. At the outset, the manager does everything. So managing new artists is, is hard work because um, you're generally on a 20% cut and at the outset, 20% of nothing is nothing. But at the same time, they're looking for business partners. They're thinking, what sort of artist am I working with? What sort of fan base are we going to build? What business partners should we work with in what order? So managers are doing all the work, but at the same time, they're identifying business partners. And then they're reaching out to those business partners and they're trying to negotiate a deal. Okay? And usually at this point, the artist lawyer would also get involved on, on, the, on the sort of the specifics of the deal. Depends. Label deal, publishing deal, usually 
big bit of work, lawyers involved, big thick contract. Most booking agents on a handshake. So, so the, the deals that you do vary greatly in formality, uh, both uh, country to country, it differs, and, and within the industry. Some of the deals on the live side, very much, it's a handshake and everybody works. Um, Labels, publishers in the main, because it's copyright assignment, will want much thicker, more uh, you know, detailed uh, contracts. Um, managers, there used to be quite a lot of managers were, were on a handshake, although I think increasingly the best practice in the management community is that shouldn't be how a management deal is structured. Um, you need to have it worked out before you fall out what happens when you fall out, um, because there are lots of managers and artists who've, who've, who've been burned by that. Grab the mic. Question. Um, so I work with my music in LA and I recently realized that there's this growing trend that's going on with managers in LA. I'm not sure if in the UK because I know you have a standard in the UK somewhat, but um, in LA managers are now telling you that they need to get a percentage of your publishing. That is starting to happen in the UK. Um, it's basically there is a thick book full of managers who tell the same story and the story is I worked with that artist and I got them to the point at which they became a global star and on the day my 20% became worth something, they fired me. Um, and every, a lot, you know, all the big managers have that story. So what do you do about that? Um, and what you normally do is, okay, in the management contract we say, if you fire me, I still get my 20% for the next three years or the next five years or whatever. The problem is, how do you enforce that? How do you know? So if you take 20% of publishing, that's fine, because now the collecting society and the publisher pay me my 20%. So that's one of the reasons why uh, in, in some managers are now saying, I'll take a little bit of the IP just to cover my back. But that's for you to decide. Right. Um, in California, there's added complications, because Californian law uh, puts limits on service contracts. So, so, so you, can, you, uh, man you can get out of a contract in California under a technicality that does doesn't exist everywhere else in the world. So, so there, there is a little bit of Californian law layering on what's happening in LA. What is this? Ma if the manager's taking 5% of my publishing, what am I getting in return? Um, so who, who is the manager? What contacts do they have? What artists are they working with? Um, what am I getting in return for that? Um, but it, it, it's a tricky one. And also, I mean, you will have a lawyer. Well, at that stage, you might not be able to afford a lawyer. If you can afford a lawyer, then a lawyer will be able to give you an opinion on whether or not it's fair. As well as the manager, you have a lawyer and you have an accountant. Everybody has a lawyer and everybody has an accountant. Um, I would say, as someone who owns a business, accountant is more important than lawyer, although I don't think there's any accountants in the room and there are lawyers, so I don't know why I'm saying that. Not going to win any fans. But I would say that, that once you start to bring in a little bit of revenue, having an accountant to just make sure that everything is ship shape. Um, Every, you know, we, we read stories all the time, don't we, of, of, of pop stars who became millionaires and then they go bankrupt because they didn't pay their tax. Um, so having a good bit of accountancy support, and actually accountants aren't necessarily that expensive, um, and then once you start to gain momentum, then you will need legal counsel. And, and artists have lawyers, managers have lawyers, labels, publishers. There's a reason why there's a lot of music lawyers in the world. So this is the music industry. And as an artist, at the outset of your career, you're probably looking for management. And once you've got management in place, the question question is, which of these deals do we need to do and when do we do them? Um, and we'll talk more about those deals and how they work and how they're structured this afternoon, particularly from the label and publishing deal, and we'll come back to management deals. Um, can you say a little bit about the characteristics of artist manager? <laughs> it's, 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 it's an interesting question. In that, um, I think... Mean, what makes a good manager and then are there and are there enough good managers out there and i think management needs at least two skills and there's an argument that very few people have both in that the manager is needs to be an entrepreneur they need to be the person who looks at the artist looks at the music looks at the fan base and says um, this is our business we are going to be in the t-shirt business um, or we are going to be in the live business but we're going to have really quirky merch that we layer on top of that and I reckon there's a brand deal to come so you're looking for a manager who is strategic 
But the manager is also the person that makes sure that the artist gets out of bed in the morning and that they're in the studio on the days they're in the studio and who shouts at people who don't get things done. Also, who cares for the artist and makes sure that the artist, you know, that, that the artist's health is, is, is good. Um, and there's an argument that, that the, the, the business side and the personal management side are two different skills. And in the US, quite a lot of artists have two managers, one to do the entrepreneurial stuff and one to do the personal management stuff. Um, but that is the challenge, is what makes a good manager. And managers come from all sorts of backgrounds. And also, different managers have different approaches. Some managers are very hands-on and run everything. Other managers really are the middlemen, who negotiate the deals and just make sure everyone does as they're told, and then possibly comes in with a little bit of strategic thinking every year or so. That's the music industry. As an artist, as a new artist, you have to decide which of these do we work with, um, and probably you need management in place to help make that happen. Okay, as I say, this afternoon we're going to talk more about the copyright stuff, and we're going to talk more about the deals. But um, let's just very quickly talk about how the music industry varies around the world, and how the music market varies around the world. And of course, the music industry is a global industry, and many artists and many music companies operate globally. And I think most artists definitely aspire to operate globally, even if they don't really. Um, I think it's interesting sometimes when artists say they are global. To be truly global, well, you've got to crack Japan for starters, okay? And the Japanese music industry is an industry of its own. Second biggest recorded music market in the world, um, hugely dominated by domestic talent, okay? So, so a lot of people who claim to be global artists haven't really broken Japan. Also, Japan, South Korea, and some of those other Asian markets are a little music industry in their own. Um, but as I say, most artists... Uh, their ambition is to be truly global. And I think in the digital age, that is easier than it ever was previously because of, of, of some of the logistical challenges are starting to disappear. So the music industry is global, and many artists want to operate in multiple territories, and many music companies operate in multiple territories. All three majors are global. They have divisions in most countries. In some countries, particularly China, they tend to go into business with a local company. Um, and of course, as I said earlier, independents often work with counterparts around the world. Although the music industry is global, it is also worth mentioning that in every country there is a music industry. So there is a Barbados music industry, there is a UK music industry, there is a US music industry. And those music industries have a lot in common, but they also have lots of things that work differently. Um, so different industries in different countries will differ in terms of structure. Okay, so the companies that I've just outlined there, in some countries, those companies will be more important than in others. In some, they'll be more established than others. Um, so the structure will differ. There's also huge differences in contractual conventions around the world. Okay, so the contract you will do in one country will be different if you did it in another country. This is true for live, where you, where you will do contracts globally. But for things like management, label, publishing, generally you do one deal with one company worldwide. You don't have to. You can do, particularly with, with record companies, publishers, you can do regional deals, give someone just North America or just Europe, but increasingly you do global deals. Um, there's then the question of if you were to do a global deal, if you were to do a deal in the US or the UK or France or Germany, those record deals would look very different. If you were to do publishing deals in those four countries, the deals would look very different. Because in every country, there are conventions about how contracts are structured. Um, and some of that is law, how contract law is written. In France, it's really complicated because artists have to be employees of the label. So rather than doing a straight record contract like we do everywhere else, it becomes an employment contract. And there's all sorts of extra bits of law get layered in by French law. Um, so, so contract law in different countries. But also some of it is just industry conventions. In some countries, we do it this way. In some countries, we do it that way. Not because that's what the law says. We've just always done it that way. Collective licensing. Collective licensing is different in the US versus uh, markets like this in the UK versus mainland Europe. Um, and that's just history. It's just how those different industries emerged. Some industries are more formal than others. Some have you know, more formal contracts. Some have more handshake contracts. And of course, copyright differs around the world. And we'll come back to that this afternoon. Although 
when you write a song in Barbados, you get protection under Barbados copyright law, which is then locked into every other copyright system around the world. However, those copyright systems differ in a multitude of different ways. So every country has its own music industry, and the structure and the culture and the, and the formalities of those industries can be different. Uh, there's an organization in the UK called the Featured Artist Coalition, which represents featured artists, as its name might suggest. And one bit of work that they're thinking about doing is within Europe, which is the best country to do a record deal? Which is the best country to do a publishing deal? Which is the best country to do a management deal from an artist's perspective? And I think they were saying UK for management, Germany for record deal, because German copyright law stops the label from getting most of the things they want, um, and possibly France for publishing. Um, so as I say, industries around the world, are, they look very similar, but there's differences going on there. As well as the formalities of the music industry, obviously every music market is also different. So in any one country, in terms of the revenue that is coming into the music industry, different parts of the business will be more important in some markets than others. So some sectors are predominantly live. That's where we make the money. Others, recorded music and publishing brings in more money. So there are certain emerging markets where until relatively recently, even though there was copyright law, it was basically impossible to enforce it. So there were, there were a number of countries around the world where the record industry just had to say, we're never going to make any money selling CDs in those countries because we just can't enforce our copyrights. So why bother? So those markets, they're live markets. You know, where can we tour? What festivals are there? We're going to make money through live. Whereas in, in Europe and North America, the copyright part of the industry is more lucrative than the live part of the industry. And actually, that's still true, despite the record industry doing that in the 2000s and the live industry doing that. But the, the record industry and the publishing sector combined is still bigger in the US and in the UK than the counterpart live industries. Um, obviously, markets differ by genre. There are certain markets where different genres are significant and others where they are not. So in the UK, we don't buy much country music. We, certainly, we don't buy much Christian music. Whereas in the US, those are big, big parts of the business. Um, so obviously, countries have their uh, genre specifications. We talked about Japan. Obviously, J-pop and K-pop are massive in those regions. Very few of those artists ever break out and get much of an audience beyond those countries. There's also the international versus domestic repertoire split. There are certain countries where um, International repertoire makes up a, a significant portion of revenue, and there are other countries where actually it is predominantly domestic repertoire. Um, some of those Asian markets, the, 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 the US and the UK, the Anglo-American, as we sometimes call it, so, so the UK, US, Australia, Ireland, Canada, those industries who generally do well on an international level compared to a lot of other regions, there are certain Asian markets where people just aren't interested. Um, and, and they predominantly listen and enjoy domestic repertoire. So music is global. Artists are global, but within every country there is a local industry that may be different and there is a local market which may be different too. Just a couple of observations about the global market though. Um, in terms of which markets are going to be most significant for you as an artist, I can't answer that question because there are a multitude of variables as to which markets matter for you. you know, so what is it about you? What is it about your genre? Um, what level are you in your career? Language, okay? I assume a lot of the people here um, uh, write songs in English or, or a dialect of English, and, and you often have an advantage on that. And a lot of European artists, mainland Europe, one of their dilemmas is, do we sing in English or do we not? Because if we sing in English, we probably are dis dis disadvantaged in our home territory, but now we can go global. Because those big UK, US markets, for some reason, we don't like music when it's sung in French, um, even though the French language can sound beautiful when it's sung but we want our music in English. So, so language can have an impact too. However, these are the five biggest recorded music markets in the world. So this is markets where recorded music, so record sales, whether that's CD or downloads or streaming and all of the other copyright income that comes in from recorded music. These are the five biggest markets in the world by revenue. So the US, then Japan, then the UK, then Germany, then France. Um, for a brief time, it looked like Japan was going to take over from the US, but that was simply because the CD plummet happened in the US long before Japan. So there are a number of years where the US was going down because CDs was, were plummeting. CD sales were still very strong in Japan. And then about four years ago, suddenly CD sales went into free fall in Japan too. And now actually the Japanese industry is struggling. But nevertheless, they remain the five biggest markets in the world. So 
a lot of artists, these are the markets they want to break into because simply when it comes to record sales and streaming and digital income, it's where there is the most revenue to share in. That said, it's important to stress just how important emerging mu markets are for the music industry and the record industry in particular uh, in 2016. The, re the record industry, so recorded music, as I said, the story of recorded music between 2000 and 2010 was down. Okay, and and uh, rec recorded music revenues dropped by at least a half between 2000 and 2010. In 10 years, 50% plus of the industry went. Okay, that's significant. Um, since about 2000, the recorded music market has been more or less flat. Okay, so the decline each year has so small it's almost negligible. Um, last year, the recorded music industry went up for the, pretty much the first time since about 2000. But, crucial, emerging markets are playing a very important role in that turning of the corner, of the decline stopping and the recorded music market starting to grow again. Okay, a big part of that is emerging markets, which in, in financial terms aren't necessarily bringing in that much money in figures, but if you combine those markets together and you look at the potential growth of those markets, they are becoming ever more significant for the global record industry. So the big five remain the big five, but the emerging markets are very important as well. Um, one very quick trend from a, from a uh, recorded music point of view, we'll come back to this tomorrow when we look at the digital market in more detail, but that the recorded music industry, the record industry, is now a predominantly digital industry. Digital brings in more money than physical worldwide. It's not true for every country. Japan, 75% CD sales. Germany, 60% CD sales. But worldwide, we're now bringing in more money through digital than physical. That only happened last year. You'd be forgiven for thinking CDs died five years ago. It's all been about downloads and streams. That's not true. However, we are now bringing in more money through digital than physical, and that is the foreseeable trend. Um, so these are the uh, exact uh, approximate breakdowns. So you'll see physical is about a third of the market, then digital, those little blobs on the right-hand side. The bigger of the two is public performance, so that's the money that you get in for your collecting society. The little slice is sync or synchronization, which we'll talk more about later. Um, and then there's the breakdown of, of, of most of the physical is CD. You're probably all aware of the vinyl revival. Vinyl is back up as a format, but it's still a tiny, tiny, tiny portion overall. Most of the physical is CD. In terms of the digital money, as it currently stands, it's 50-50 download stream. However, downloads are going down and streaming is going up. So this year, it will be more from streams than downloads. We'll come back to more of that tomorrow. Um, but the key trend is that CDs are slowly declining. They radically declined in the 2000s. They're now slowly declining. Downloads are tanking. Okay. The one thing you need to know about downloads is that they're downloads. Um, so download sales are in steep decline. Streaming is booming. The question is which streaming services, and more on that tomorrow. Those are global trends. It is worth noting that it varies greatly from country to country. And there are some countries like Japan, which are still predominantly physical, and there are other countries like Scandinavia, Sweden, where digital is totally dominant. And many of the emerging markets, because there was never any CD sales, uh, digital has completely run away um, and become much more significant. Um, so the, 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 the split between digital and physical and between download and stream varies greatly from country to country and market to market. We know this because the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry which is the global trade body for the record industry, puts out a, a, a set of statistics every April, which gives us global figures and then country by country figures. So actually, we have good stats for the record industry, um, whereas for the other parts of the industry, we have less good stats. Um, the record industry is bigger than live and bigger than publishing. But if you combine the record industry and publishing together, it still outperforms live. Does that make sense? Um, so in the 2000s, the record industry went down, the live industry went up, although worldwide, the record industry and the publishing sector combined, so music rights, 
is still bigger than live when you go worldwide. The other thing about live is it's a very um, top-heavy industry in that the big artists make most of the money. And the live company, if you look at a company like Live Nation, it has massive revenues, um, but not massive profits because it's expensive putting on live music. And there are economies of scale. Once you get to bigger venues, you make more money. But then once you get to bigger venues, you're working with artists who decide that they want a, a laser show and a massive set and 82 dancers and a big video installation. And all of that is expensive. So, so although live has high revenues, it's not necessarily so profitable. Um, so there's just some top line observations about the music industry worldwide, the music market worldwide, and some recent trends. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take any remaining questions of anything that I have said. Um, and then over lunch, I want you to have a think about your music industry, okay? So the music industry here in Barbados. And if you remember, th these were all the companies that I talked about, the publishers, the labels, the distributors, the retailers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, which of those exist in Barbados and who are they? And which of those actually you don't really have locally? And of these, are there US companies or European companies that have a presence here? Um, or is it predominantly run by local companies or individuals and entrepreneurs? I had seen that we had the top music mar markets as the US, Japan, UK, Germany, and France. But in terms of Sweden, when it was in the UK, it was mainly main not as the US, the UK, then Sweden. So was there a drop recently, or this is just in terms of physical or just net? Um, the if Sweden is in the list, that is talking about streaming income. Okay, because where Sweden, where Sweden is, at, Sweden's the home of Spotify, um, and and in Sweden, digital is is 90% of the record industry, and of that, 90% of it is Spotify. Sweden's an unusual market. iTunes never took off in Sweden, so Sweden did this: CDs, piracy, Spotify. Okay, and that's what happened in Sweden. Um, Streaming is generating a lot of income in Sweden. No, hang on. Yes, yeah, streaming is generating a lot of income in Sweden, mainly Spotify. Um, what everybody is desperately hoping is that Sweden is the future. And that Sweden's just ahead of everybody else. And eventually, every market is going to be making lots of money from streaming like Sweden. There's a chance that Sweden's just odd. Okay, it may be that it's the future. It may be that it's just an odd market, um, and and that that isn't the future. So 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 we'll see. In terms of signing up with the Spotify, do you have to be because I've noticed that there are actually problems getting onto that. You need a distributor. Local. Right. Okay. So, so a tune core or a CD baby or so somebody like that. Only take it through a distributor. Correct. Sign up uh, as a label, you could. As, label. as an individual artist, unless you're a big name artist, then they're not going to do the work. No. Okay. So you need a distributor. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Any other questions? There's one over here. The mic is moving around the room. So if one person from Barbados wrote a song, another person from, let's say, America. Yes. They have different rules, different legal Yes. Rules. How is it determined which one takes over the case? Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I think you, you, your, your different segments of the copyright would be subject to the local jurisdiction. Um, it would depend if it was published first. That's one of those very complicated things where it's another it depends. If you have contracts, if you were assigned artists, then the contract would state what jurisdiction these things are happening in. Um, but it, it, when, the, when you have people collaborating, it, it would depend on the scenario and, and what the incident was. You would both log it with your local collecting society. Um, if you then wanted to sue, um, that would be a question for the lawyer to work out, of where you would sue and, and, and on what grounds. Exactly. If, if, if there's a contract in place, then the contract will state this contract is under the jurisdiction of. Okay? And if it's a US contract, it won't just be US, it will be the state that it's under. Um, but if it's just two people informally collaborating, well, it, would, it arguably will get protection under both, but you would need to decide. The, each copyright system sets criteria of what it is protecting, and you would have to do we fulfill both of those criteria, and if we do, where do we sue and on what grounds? Okay, another question. Um, my question pertains to authorship, because in the country of origin, which is the country of first publication, um, because they have published with Exlibris, 
as an author, um, that means that the country that has jurisdiction would be the first country of origin, which is the United States. Yeah. So anything that falls within the jurisdiction here in Barbados would not have precedent. Um, correct. So each copyright system sets criteria of what gets automatic protection. So under the UK system, it's either you are British, or it's published by a British publication, or it's published in Britain first. So, so you, you're, you, you decide which of those locks you to that copyright system. So it would depend on what the specific criteria in, in your local copyright system and the US are, and then you make some decisions on where it's best for it to be locked. The one thing to say about the US, however, is the US is unusual in that it has copyright registration. So if, if, if it is first published in the US and that is where you're going to get your core protection from, then your publisher needs to fill out a form and log it with the copyright office in the US. Because um, nearly everywhere else there is no copyright registration, but in the US there is, um, and you need to make sure that it's registered because if you don't, you can still claim protection down the line, but it gets messy. Um, so if you are protected under US first, then make sure your publisher is registering it. Um, okay. um, I've done that. Good. Maybe you can talk about the importance of building your local um, home market. Yeah, and I think particularly from a live side, and you're right, this is happening all over the world, um, is I, I said at the start, at the grassroots, you're not really making much money out of live, but it's absolutely key to building your fan base. And, and that's important from an artist's perspective, but it also means that people who are promoting shows at a grassroots level are really struggling to make any money. Um, and actually, the only person who really makes the money is whoever owns the bar. Okay, because that's how you make money at that level. And so one of the challenges is, you, we've seen grassroots venues, so venues where you play to 80 people. We've seen those going out of business for various reasons. So some of that is economic, because the economics of making a profit at that level are so tight that if you have a slight economic downturn, as we have in the world in the last 10 years, um, whereas the big players can, can swallow the economic downturn, for the grassroots players, that's enough to put them out of business. You're right, you then layer on top of that, and this is a problem in the UK, particularly in certain cities, that the local licensing authorities are making it harder to get a license, either in terms of paperwork or in terms of whether or not you're allowed a license. Um, we've also had this issue in certain UK cities where uh, you have a rundown part of town, then some venues move in, they make that part of town cool, so then suddenly the property developers move in and they convert all these empty warehouses into apartments, so then all the, the, the expensive apartments, then wealthy people move in because they want to live somewhere cool, but then they say, oh, but we don't want any loud music at night. And then suddenly the, council, the venues Count, uh, license comes up for renewal and they can't get a license. And I mean, that, and that just seems insane. And in Australia, um, there's a principle called agent of change, which is to help the grassroots music community, which says that if a property developer changes what was an industrial building into a residential building, when they do that, they have to look around and say, there's a music venue, there's a club, there's a bar. Their business could be put at risk because of this. So me, the property developer, has to put some money on the table and says, okay, Mr. Music Music venue, Mr. Barr, here's the money to put some really good soundproofing in and to cover the two months that you're shut while you're putting the soundproofing in. And, and the property developer has to include that. So that's a principle that exists in Australia. It's something that the UK music industry is lobbying for in the UK. Um, so yes, th th I think uh, what a lot of people say is everyone agrees that the, la the grassroots live is absolutely crucial for everything. Everybody started playing to 50 people in a bar. Um, and if those bars can't do that anymore, that's a problem for everybody. So there, are, there is licensing issues there. There's also money issues. And the question is, if it's not economically viable to operate at that level, what do we do about that? Um, now, is it, I mean, there are, there are three potential things, which is A, in the record industry, the big stars pay for the new stars. Okay, so the record companies, for all of their sins, take money from successful artists and then pump some of it into new artists. So should the live sector be doing more of that? So that the big arena shows put money into small venues. Now, Live Nation and AEG would argue that they do do that. But I'm not so convinced. Um, the other thing is, at a grassroots level, does the artist even need a promoter? Or could the artist do it themselves? Could the artist put on the show themselves, cut out the middleman, and therefore you don't need to make as much money? The other thing is, should government be investing 
in live venues. Not big live venues that, that, that you know, government like because they've got a nice big venue, in the grassroots venues where new artists emerge. Is that something where you know, arts councils or whatever should be investing money? And some European countries, they do that. With, with, with the Music Calendar Report and other um, talks and events, and there is now, yes, alongside The Great Escape, we now have a separate conference called Music Cities, which precedes The Great Escape on this very issue. And there's two things to say about that. First of all, um, what the, those cities that have had success in this space have learned is we all agree that a grassroots venue network is important for the future of culture and the future of music. But what the Music Cities people who have worked in this space will say is, but that's not your opening line when you talk to government. Your opening line is a body of research, the Music Canada being the biggest, that shows if you can foster a music community in your city or your town, great stuff will follow. Okay, because tech people like music people. So if you can get a vibrant music community going, a tech community may follow it in and then you build a startup sector and things start to grow. Plus, tap into travel okay, and tourism. Music is also tourism. So talk about music as something that facilitates tourism. Iceland's a great example here of a country that, that built a festival at the end of its season and in doing so extended the tourism season in Iceland by two weeks. So the, the Iceland tourist season now is two weeks longer because they put a festival at the end and they got the local airline to pay for it because the airline benefits from all the other people flying in. Um, so part of it is how you position what you're saying. Isn't it's great for music and culture. It is, but that doesn't necessarily always fly with government. And then the second thing is, yeah, then having a, 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 a to-do list that progresses up. So to-do list number one is, we just want better licensing. To-do list number two is, we want the parking spaces, we want the rehearsal room, we want this. Number three is, now we want money. Okay, but you, you get people to invest with, actually, initially you're saying, we don't want your money, we just want your help. And then once you've got their help, then you start asking for money. Right, okay, so, um I feel as if one of the biggest issues artists we have um, is that we have a we don't really have a music industry to be in there, and then we have people like Avenue Row who do stuff like Honey Jam, and that gives people the opportunity to sing other types of music other than soca and reggae and that kind of stuff. Problem is, is that the soca artists are the only artists who are actually making money on the island because there's an actual festival catered to that. Yeah. No, and I, and I think, well, A, you're, you're a very small market to start with, but I think you're right, certain, certain regions that associate with a specific genre, there are upsides to that, but then everybody, and, and, and in Europe you find this with cities, certain cities get associated with a genre, which is great for the people in that city who are part of that genre, and a real pain for everyone else, because then it's like, oh, you come from Brighton, you must make this sort of music. And it's like, well, <laughs> why? Um, but coming back to two things you said, I think in terms of what music industry is there here, that's what we're going to talk about when we come back. In terms of the digital stuff, that's very much the focus as we move forward. I'll be talking about that tomorrow and big time on Friday of the importance of how do you take that audience with you at the end of the show? Um, and how do you connect with them online and what can you subtly do to get the connections, the email addresses or whatever it is that you need to continue the conversation. Anyway, we are now very much at lunch, um, so we are going to break. Are we going to have some logistics before we break? Just a quick one. Okay, and then I'll be back talking about copyright and carrying on some of the conversations we've already had um, straight after lunch.